12. Um, yeah, a lot of, lot of things that we... Would you hit those lights closest to you? Not hit them, but turn them on. Yes, turn them on. And the next two. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite moments from the week was at the very beginning of the week when the Olympic theme played and Mallet came running in here carrying a torch. It wasn't a real torch, in case anyone's wondering. We, we weren't like, you know doing something that dangerous. The other thing that I think everybody walked away from the week realizing was, if ever you are in need of knowing how to entertain children, dodgeball, you know? I mean, dodgeball is just a fail-safe. Always have a ball handy, and you can do children's ministry. It was amazing. Okay, Acts chapter 12. This is where we're going to start this morning. Now, this morning, I'm, just, this, I'm going to add a couple of disclaimers here at the very beginning. You've heard me say this before. I'll say it again. I... I kind of have two ways that I have to teach, okay? One is I just study, write down a bunch of stuff, um, and, and kind of get it all in here, and then I get up here with no notes of any kind and just go for it. Um, the other way that I, that I teach is I have to write everything down. It, it's like there's no middle of the road for me. If I do bullet points, I just end up severely confused. Because I'll start with a bullet point, and then I'll kind of end, and then I'll look down, and I'll think, now how was I going to go from here to there? Well, this morning, I've written down half of my stuff, um, and I'm trusting the Lord. And it's really because there's, this is one of those studies that could probably be, there's five things we're going to look at today. Each of them probably could be a study in and of itself. And so because of that, we've, we've kind of condensed it all down into one discussion, and the title this morning is The Problems of the Early Church. Now, we've been doing this series, if you've been with us or if you're visiting, we, we've given this banner to our series, Snapshots of the Early Church. We've not been going verse by verse through the book of Acts, but what we've been doing is stepping back and just looking each week at a different aspect of the life of the early church, and we've done many up to this point. The prayers of the early church, the preaching of the early church, the purity of the early church, the passion of the early church. But one of the things that you cannot miss when you look into the book of Acts is that the early church, there were problems. And here's why I think that's important. There can be a tendency whenever we talk about the early church to over-romanticize it, you know, and, and we can think that it was this utopian society and everything was great, and everybody got along, and there were no problems of any kind whatsoever. Not so. What's really interesting is that many of the problems they encountered are the exact same problems we encounter today. Now, in talking about the problems of the early church, again, kind of a disclaimer, here's what we don't want to do. And I make this observation because I see it happening a lot. I see it happening particularly like on social media or, or in, you know, news media. I think we, as the church of 2017, and, and understand what I'm saying, okay? I understand that we should be humble and, and filled with grace and, you know, we should love people. But I, but I think what we have to be careful of doing is I don't think that we should get into a mode of constantly apologizing for the church and constantly saying how the church has gotten it wrong all these years. Look, everybody knows the church is filled with imperfect people. Okay, And like I said, this morning we have the, the luxury of being able to look at when the church was just getting started, and, and there were problems even then. But you know, to get into this mentality of to think that, oh, well... If we could just go to the world and apologize for all the stuff we got wrong, that that somehow would make them more attracted to it. That's like saying, I went to this restaurant and the food was really bad, but you should go to it. I'm not sure that's a great selling point. Um, the other thing that I would say is this, and I want to be careful not to go in this direction today. All I want to do is kind of illuminate some things from the scriptures and when I say the problems of the early church, not so much, oh, you know, you and me, but, but more like, what are some real challenges that the church encounters? But I think we have to be careful 
of not thinking that it's ever any of our ministries to take up the mantle of constantly pointing out the ugliness of the church. Because there's a lot of ministries out there that have sort of devoted themselves to that. Oh, church leadership's gotten it wrong here, and if the church only spent its money better here, and oh, there's this and there's that and the other. Which, if you take what the Bible says about the church literally, that we are the bride of Christ, you want to be careful not to run around calling Jesus' wife ugly. Right? You can say whatever you want to me, but if you call my wife ugly, I'm coming after you. Okay? I don't think that we should just run around and go, you know what's wrong with the church? Hey, Jesus, you know what's wrong with your wife? Yeah, you. I don't think we should do that. Okay, so I just want to add those little disclaimers here at the beginning this morning. We're not here to say, oh, here's all the problems. Here's what's wrong with the church. We're not apologizing. All we're doing is looking into the scriptures and saying, okay, this was a very real challenge for the early church. But can we take that and look at it through the lens of today and see very similar challenges for the church of 2017. So that's kind of our goal this morning. Let's do this before we read. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for a great time already this morning. Father, thank you that you're here with us, that you are faithful, you're true to your word, that you've said where we're gathered together in your name, there you are in our midst. And we sense that this morning. And I pray, God, as we turn our attention now to your word, that it would be you that it would be your very self that, that leaps off the page, that you write your word on our heart, that you continue to shape us and mold us and make us more and more into your image and likeness. Thank you that you've called us by your name. Thank you that you've drawn us, you've brought us near by your blood, that you've adopted us, you've called us sons and daughters, you've made us a, a nation of kings and priests that we share in an eternal inheritance in the heavenlies, Lord. Thank you that you're building a kingdom. And I pray this morning that our hearts would, would brim with a hunger to see your kingdom come and to see your righteousness reign and rule. Father, we ask this morning not that you fix everybody else, Lord. Fix us. Work in our hearts. May we feel the sculpting hand of your spirit at work. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the problems of the early church. Now, uh, these are not presented in any particular order, okay? I've just kind of highlight, highlighted different things. Again, there's five of them. The, the first one that I want to talk about this morning, the early church did have opposition from the government, okay? Look at Acts chapter 12. Let's start reading in verse 1. It says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand, watch this, to harass some from the church. Then, we read, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, the ultimate politician here, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Well, that worked. Let's do it again. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Now, there's other instances in the book of Acts where we see the early church encountering some opposition for the, from the government. We think about Paul the Apostle, for instance, for instance, in Acts chapter 24, when he's with Felix the governor. We think about Acts chapter 25, when he's there with King Agrippa. Okay, so this was something that was just a very real thing in the life of the early church. And look, it's true that the church today can encounter opposition from the government, but, but here's the thing, okay? Here's what we have to remember. The Bible's really clear about how we, what our mindset and mentality should be toward the government. First of all, the Bible tells us that every government that exists has been set up by God himself for his purpose. And that we're to submit to the government. And we're also told that we're to pray. 
for the kings and all who are in authority. Okay, it's, it's kind of fascinating to me how the church of today often makes the same mistake that the Jews of Jesus' day made. They had somehow gotten it into their minds that the Messiah was there to deal with their political problems. They were absolutely convinced that what the Messiah was there to do was to deal with the evil Roman Empire and just put them in charge. And when he didn't do it, they killed him. Now, look, this this thought process even filtered down to Jesus' disciples because after he is killed and resurrected, one of the very first things they ask him is, oh, okay, now that you've got the the death and resurrection out of the way, now are you going to set up your government? You know, they were just, their mindset was, this is what you're here to do. Can I just say that there's nowhere in the Bible that Jesus ever called for political upheaval? Ever. And the Roman Empire was a pretty corrupt place. I mean, historically speaking, you know, there's nowhere in the Bible that the scriptures ever call for political or social reform. And so what we have to be careful of, and again, you see this, you see this on Facebook and social media a lot, that here I am in my Christian camp, but I'm going to politicize. Now, I'm not saying that the Bible shouldn't inform your political view, especially when it comes to things like Israel, Jerusalem, and things of that nature. But we have to be careful that we don't get into a mode of thinking that what Jesus' mission is to somehow get somebody elected into the White House. And if he would just get the right person elected into the White House who would deal with taxes in the right way and the school system in the right way and let me carry guns, you know, that everything would be fine. Can I just tell you, he's building a kingdom, but it's not the United States. Now, that's one of those things we all nod, (laughs) amen, but some are thinking, you better shut up right there, Mr. Kevin. (laughs) Because for many of us, I don't mean many in this room, I mean many certainly highly visible people or vocal people from the church community, we have somehow interwoven our patriotism and our Christianity. Even though we've been born again and we're now citizens of heaven and we're called not to set our minds on things here on the earth, but on things that are above, where Christ is, where he is seated. So it's just really interesting to me that the early church did encounter opposition from the government. Do I think the day is coming that we will begin to encounter more and more opposition from the government? Yes. But I think it's all foretold right here. Nothing happens that God doesn't know about and is not allowed and even foreordained. You know, we, we hear that, that passage about all the governments of the world have been appointed by God. And we say, well, yeah, okay, I believe that. But what about this government over here? All the governments. Well, yeah, I know. But what about that? All the governments. They exist because God has put them there for his purposes, to bring about his plan. And we, we need to understand that. It may be hard, but when we set our minds on eternity, when we begin to live our lives from eternity backwards, knowing that this is all temporary, knowing this is not where we're staying, knowing that this, this thing, you know, will just continue to become more and more awry as we go. And because of that, I begin to long more and more for our heavenly home. So there was opposition from the government. Now, the other interesting thing in the book of Acts, turn with me if you would to Acts chapter 4, is that the early church also encountered <clears throat> opposition from I'll say it this way, other religious groups. Okay, the church encountered opposition from other religious groups. There was opposition from the government, but the solution was not end the government. 
or get the right government elected, there was also opposition from other religious groups. Look and you will, if you would at Acts chapter 4, verse 1. It says, now as they spoke to the people, this is Peter and John. They've just um, healed the, the lame guy, you know, there in, uh, as they've made their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. And this has resulted in an opportunity for Peter to once again share the word of God. And many other people have gotten saved. It says, as they spoke to the people, verse 1, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Skip over the next verse, look at verse 5. It says, It came to pass on the next day that their rulers, their elders, their scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And they, when they had set them in the midst, they said, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, it's easy for us sometimes to look back through the lens of historicity, right? We, we benefit from having the word of God in front of us. And we know that these religious leaders, they were the bad guys, right? But in Jesus's day, certainly when he came onto the scene, and he said something like, unless your righteousness exceeds the, the, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that would be like somebody coming on the scene today and saying, hey, unless you're a better Christian than Billy Graham, you'd be like, what? what? And by the way, there are no better or worse Christians, okay? There's just, you are a Christian or you're not. The Bible never speaks in degrees of discipleship. I'm a good Christian. What's a good Christian Christian? versus a bad Christian, all right? You're just a Christian. You're born again. Everybody's the same citizen of the same kingdom in the kingdom of God. But I have an idea. <laughs> but one of the things that I think it's, it's, hard, it's easy, I should say, for us to, to miss is that these people in Acts chapter 4 who arrested them, they were the religious community. You know, we think, oh, these are the bad guys. These were the religious leaders. So the early church, which sometimes was called the way in the book of Acts, that the Christians were, they were called Christians first in Antioch, little Christ. It was a derogatory term. But they received opposition from other religious groups. Now, we see that same thing today. There are religious groups in the world that are very opposed to the church. And we could talk about, you know, some of the very obvious ones. You know, we think about Islam, very opposed to the church, very opposed to anyone who is not Muslim. Um, you know, we think about all these groups. It's, in fact, it's really fascinating when you start looking at the world uh, environment, like, one of the major things that's going to keep people out of heaven is religion. I mean, it's crazy to see how Satan has designed this thing. Because remember, his goal all along was to be worshipped. Then he knows we were created to be worshipping beings. So it's like, well, you know what? I'm just going to set up all these false religious systems. That way, they're going to worship because that's their natural inclination. And I'm going to end up being worshipped because I'm behind it. And now I'm like God. So it's pretty diabolical that there's all these false religious systems. And people think they're worshipping the true God. And that's what's going to keep them out of heaven. But many, many religious groups opposed to the true church. Now, again, it would be easy to kind of go through and just begin to enumerate all the highly obvious ones. But I think the ones that we need to be really observant of are the groups who call themselves Christians, but are actually opposed to the truth of the gospel. You know, for all intents and purposes, these Jews, these religious leaders of Paul's day, they were absolutely convinced that they were worshiping God accurately. And there are all kinds of theories and suggestions floating around out there, and we'll get to false teaching a little bit later on, because that was definitely one of the other things 
that was going on in the early church. But you know, the idea of Chrislam, you know, of marrying certain tenets of Christianity with various tenets of Islam to sort of make this united religious movement, that's definitely gaining momentum. Again, when we come to the book of Revelation, we'll see more and more evidence pointing towards something like that. Um, atheism. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me how atheism has kind of begun to be thought of as a religion. It, or, or the term irreligious is becoming more and more popular. I'm irreligious. And yet, subscribing to a certain school of thought. Evolutionary thought is another example of something highly opposed to the church. I mean, evolution has doctrine. And you read the writings of people from long ago and you buy into what was written as your worldview. I mean, that's kind of the same thing with Christianity. You read what was written and by faith you believe this to be true. And so there's all of those kinds of things. Now, where I want to springboard from that is to talk about something that I think we could tie to it, and that is this. The threat of terrorism. Look, you'll hear people say all the time that, oh, the world's just getting worse and worse. True confession, I'm not 100% sure I agree with that statement. I, I, I mean, when you look down at the Dark Ages, um, when you look at, you know, some of the Roman Caesars, you know, taking Christians and sticking them up on a pole and dipping them in tar and lighting them on fire and riding around in your chariot for entertainment, you know, American Ninja Warrior has yet to feature a Christian being thrown to a lion as one of the competitions. Now, look, we understand there's lots of persecution happening in lots of places of the world. That's true. But the idea that the threat of terrorism is somehow a new thing, not necessarily. I mean, when you look at the book of Acts, uh, let me just read to you a couple of things. Acts chapter 8 says this, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, and as for Saul, who by the way, who became comes the Apostle Paul. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women to prison. Acts chapter 9 says, check this out, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples, asked for letters from the high priests so that if he found any who were of the way, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. I mean, this, for all intents and purposes, is religious extremism. You know, we kind of get in our minds that Saul was, I mean, he was bad, you know, and, and he kind of gave the church a hard time. Dude, he was beating down doors and taking, you know, moms and dads off to prison and he was breathing. I mean, the, the imagery there of just sort of seething in the idea of doing away, murdering, breathing threats and murder against the church. That's terrorism. I mean... The book of Acts tells us that when Saul, again, who eventually becomes Paul, when he's born again and he first is brought to the disciples, they, they weren't 100% sure that they were going to go along with this idea. You know, you think if you grabbed a hold of a highly visible terrorist in the world today and he walked in the doors of Calvary Chapel, Yuba City, and said, I'm here to worship Jesus, how would we react? So there was this threat, even in the early church. So what happens with this is it begins to shrink the distance between us and them. Because we think of, oh, the early church. There's just one church, right? My son, Kaysen, is the same Kaysen that he's going to be when he's 12 and 20. Now he's going to grow and mature, and the church certainly has gone through different phases, we might say, but it's still the same church. Don't, don't take the early church and, and put it over here and go, oh, look, look how great that was. Problems with the government, right? Problem from opposing religious groups, the threat of terrorism, 
And we begin to realize, oh, wait a minute. What was happening with them is kind of the same thing that's happening with us today. Here's the next thing that we want to talk about. Oh, huh, this will be a good one. Financial difficulties, right? Financial difficulties. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 11. <clears throat> Acts chapter 11. You'll remember we did a study, oh, several weeks ago now, on the giving of the early church. And, you know, we looked at several things, and one of the things we looked at was how at the church in Jerusalem, through them giving their lives to Christ and their, and their lives kind of being overwhelmed, uh, they began to develop this very loose touch on material things. And the Bible talks about how they would take their items or, you know, their possessions and they would sell them, and they would bring the proceeds and lay them at the disciples' feet, and they would distribute to all as anyone had need. That's the first time you see Barnabas coming onto the scene. Uh, then in Acts chapter 5, you see a problem that arose with Ananias and Sapphira because they sold some of their possessions, but they kept back part of the proceeds and brought it to the church saying that that was sort of the sum of the proceeds. And Peter, of course, approaches them and said, why are you lying about this? And God just strikes them both dead. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. He just kills them both. And we talked about the purity of the early church. Now... The same church in Jerusalem, look here in Acts chapter 11, towards the end of the chapter, verse 27, here's what we read. It says, In these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus, verse 28, Acts chapter 11, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also had happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined, watch this, to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, you could write down a couple of cross-references here. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Romans chapter 15. It's mentioned briefly in Acts chapter 24. We don't have time to look at every single one of these passages today. But one of the things you see is that the church in Jerusalem did incur some financial difficulty. Part of it could have been because of what they were doing with their possessions. Remember, that was never mandated. It was never a spoken, thus saith the Lord, go sell all your stuff. It was something that they did. There was never a command to do that. So it could have been because of that, but we also read here that a famine came upon them. But you look into the writing of Paul the Apostle, and one of the things that Paul the Apostle did was he began to go around to other churches, and he was taking up a collection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the, the idea that's used for collection is a special collection, and it was being taken up for the church in Jerusalem. He actually writes to the Corinthian church. You guys who were here when we talked about the giving of the early church, you'll remember this. He actually compared the giving of the Corinthian church to the giving of the churches in Macedonia. And he said, I'm testing the sincerity of your love. Because his whole thing was, if Christ was willing to lose everything so that you could become rich, then we ought to be able to let go of some of our material stuff so that other people can benefit. And this is the whole thing that you read about, this collection that was taken up for the church in Jerusalem. My point is simply this. The idea of a church having financial difficulty isn't a new phenomenon. By the way, God doesn't need your money. Okay? I was watching a, a video the other day on Facebook, and of course this was being done purely in jest towards Christianity, but one of the things that the comedian was talking about was that how God always, always needs money. God does not need money. Just so we get that straight. God does not need money. Um... He has no need of it. Anybody who's building a place where the streets are made of gold, that thing that we highly prize, I mean, let's just face it, he doesn't need it. Um, but here's what's interesting, uh, and kind of follow me on this. You know, there's an old adage, and you guys who have been around Calvary Chapel for a long time, you've heard the expression, where God guides, God provides. Which, by the way, I agree with. Um, but here's the thing. When it comes to financial stuff, we have to be careful of over-spiritualizing it, right? Because I believe Paul probably 
believed and understood that, hey, where God guides, God provides. And yet he went around and took up a collection. Because where God guides, God does provide. And one of the ways that he often provides is through people who give money. You know, so we have to be careful of going, oh, you know, well, if God's really in it, he's going to provide. Well, hang on a second. What about all the false religious movements in the world today? All the false teaching, all the false teachers that are filling stadiums and flying around in jets. They obviously have been very well taken care of, right? Is God in that? So if we use our litmus test being, well, if God's really in it, there's going to be money. Not necessarily. Sometimes the wicked prosper, and sometimes the church can be hurting. But my point is simply this. It's kind of comforting to know, wow, okay, even in the early church, right? This thing that, oh, seemed so perfect. They had financial difficulty too, but they responded to it appropriately. They donated money. So, it's just interesting to me. Okay, here's one of the other things that the church dealt with. People. <laughs> one of the biggest problems of the early church was people. <laughs> now look, I say that sort of in jest, okay? You know, you've heard the old joke before about looking for the perfect ministry, one that doesn't have people, you know? And that's, you know, it's true. You, you find people who their mentality, you know, is kind of like they, they become so jaded where they think, oh, if I could just find that ministry that doesn't have people, then I'd be happy. Not, I'm not putting thoughts into his head, but I just sort of, even when I read the gospel sometimes, I'm like, I wonder if Jesus ever thought that. You know, I mean, the number of times that like his disciples would do something and he would look at them and just be like, Really? He asks him that one time, are you still so dull? He, he, he's are, you, are you still that stupid? I mean, do you still not get this whole thing that I'm here to do? Where's your faith? You know, he, so it's just interesting. You know, when James and John, you know, they're going through Samaria and the Samaritans won't accept them. And Jesus has got his face set towards Jerusalem. And they turn to Jesus and they say, should we call down fire and burn them alive? Jesus just like, what? What? What are you talking about? You don't, you don't know what spirit you're of, you know? So there is no ministry that doesn't involve people. So if you have your heart set towards ministry and I'm dashing your hopes this morning, Sorry, you, you know, I mean, you're just not going to find a ministry where you don't have people to deal with. But if you turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 15, okay? Now, look, there are several instances in the Bible where you see people problems, disagreements. Okay, we think about, don't turn there, but Acts chapter 6. The whole occasion when the original deacons were selected was that there was a dispute between the Hebrews and the Hellenists because some of their widows were being overlooked in this daily distribution that was happening. Or if you look in Acts chapter 15, towards the beginning of the chapter, you have this whole debate. Look, look with me, if you would, uh, verse 1 of chapter 15. It says, Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Verse 2, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. Okay, those are fighting words. Th this was a heated debate in the life of the early church. This was not, oh, you guys, <laughs> we got to be circumcised to be saved. That's a good one. <laughs> I love you, bro. No, it was like, no, what you're teaching is wrong. I'm sorry, it's wrong. And by the way, I'm going to get ahead of myself here. Um, one, one thing that, that I think we have to all like get better at is don't, don't take a personality clash and turn it into sin. Okay? There, there are people who have a different sense of humor than you. Right? <laughs> there are people who listen to different music than you. There are people who shop at different places than you and who vacation at different places than you. 
and you may be 100% absolutely convinced and convicted in your heart that I should not do that thing. Now look, if it's clearly spelled out in Scripture, okay, Scripture's on your side. But in these matters that the Word of God has not clearly spoken, as a for instance, in the life of the early church, some people were convinced they should worship on Saturday, some people were convinced they should worship on Sunday. We've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? We've got spirit. Yes, we do. And it turned into this back and forth debate. Some people were absolutely convinced you could not eat meat. Some people were convinced eating meat was fine. Some people think we should boycott certain companies. And that's fine. That's your conviction. Be careful, though, not to make it thus saith the Lord. Because Paul says, the Word of God says, let each be convinced in his own mind. When the Word of God has not clearly spoken, you may have a conviction about it. Cool. Now look, if that conviction and your freedom begins to cause other people to stumble, I mean, we're kind of getting into a whole other Bible study at this point. All I'm saying is that there were disagreements in the early church. But I think what we have to be careful of is we have to be careful of not taking disagreements and, and turning them into, oh, well, I mean, the, the, fail, the, 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 the fail all is, well, that's so unloving. I hear people say this all the time. Oh, that's so unloving. You know, somebody disagrees with you. Oh, that's so unloving. You know, I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that if we had walked the earth when Jesus was doing his earthly ministry, and we saw him come into the temple and drive people out with his bare hands, with a whip made of cords, we would have said, how unloving. That when he turned to the, to the Pharisees, angry, by the way, and called them a brood of vipers, I think we would have said, ah, maybe he's not the Messiah. What about when he turns to Peter, one of his closest friends, and says, would you get behind me, Satan? Did you hear what he just said? I thought he was the Messiah. He called me Satan. 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 How unloving. I know. I don't know if I'm going to go to his church anymore. But we do that all the time. I can't believe he said that. I can't believe he said the thing about the government. I can't believe he told that joke. I can't believe he said we shouldn't boycott that company over there that does that thing. How unloving. Just be careful, right? Be careful. People are different than you. And they may have different convictions in you, but, but again, be careful. Don't turn it into a sin thing. They may laugh at a joke that you don't laugh at. They may watch movies that you don't watch. They may listen to, they may listen to music that you don't listen to. They may eat foods that you don't eat. They may, you know, I mean, just be careful. Okay, I'm moving on. Sorry. I'm sort of counseling myself at this point. Um, so Acts chapter 15, look, e even in Philippians chapter Four, is it? Paul writes in one of his letters, he says, I implore Judea and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And he said, and I urge you, true companion, help these women. Something was happening between a couple of the ladies in the church. And Paul was like, help them, please, because they're arguing about something. Look, the entire occasion of the book of Philemon, this little letter, you know what the occasion was, right? Onesimus, which again, I love to say that name. He had fled from Philemon, who was his slave owner, and Paul was writing to Philemon saying, I'm sending him back. But he said, I want you to receive him. You know, don't hold this against him. Galatians chapter 2. I, I mean, there's this occasion there when uh, Paul is in Jerusalem, and Peter, he's... I'll just read it to you. He says, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him or opposed him to his face. Because he was to be, to be blamed. 
Because certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself. He says, a lot of people were carried away and played the hypocrite with them. Even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. So Paul basically says, I stood up and challenged the Pope in front of everybody. How unloving, right? But these were real people problems in the early church. One of the, probably the most famous or, or infamous that we could look at is here in Acts chapter 15, towards the end of the chapter. Many of you know where I'm going with this. This is, this is Paul and Barnabas, right? This is Batman and Robin. I mean, this is the dynamic duo of the early church, the first missionary journeys. I mean, here they are. They've been through so much together. But on one of their missionary journeys, a young man by the name of John Mark left them and went back home. So here's what it says, Acts chapter 15, verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas, verse 37, was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, and Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren by, to the grace of God. Church split. Sort of. Paul and Barnabas, these two guys who've been through so much and God's done so much to them. Here's two very godly men having an argument. Look, there will be things that you may argue about. Husbands and wives, you know, you, you may have an argument. Me and Ed... And Keith, we argue about stuff. Here's, here's why. You don't argue about stuff you don't care about. But be careful not to walk away from an argument and go, I'm done. It's always fascinated me that the Holy Spirit is completely silent about who was right and who was wrong. Because that's how we're wired, aren't we? We, we, hey, I don't care what happened. I just want to know who's right. And we love to find little ways of saying, I think Paul was right. And then other people go, yeah, but, you know, hey, I think Barnabas. I mean, look at the tremendous ministry that God had with him and how he, you know, used John Mark and he discipled him and how many years later Paul would write and say, send Mark to me. He's useful to me in ministry. All true. But be careful not to try to answer that question without proof of who was right. And who was wrong? Because the Holy Spirit never does it. And I think it's in, on purpose. I think God remains completely silent on the who's right and who's wrong issue. We talked about it months ago when we studied through Ezra and Nehemiah. Remember? The people had intermarried with the pagan people groups. And there's Ezra. He goes to the steps of the temple and he rips out his beard and he's crying. And all the people repent. And then Nehemiah comes on the scene several years later. The people have intermarried with pagan people group. Nehemiah goes to the people and he rips out their beards. And, they, and the people repent. You know, who was right? Nehemiah, Ezra ripped out his own beard. Maybe that's what you should have done. That's why I shave, you know. <laughs> I find people with beards, you know. And, and look, we just... We run into problems when we start trying to quantify and say... The Ezra's are better than the Nehemiah's. The Paul's are better than the Barnabas's. They're right. I'm wrong. I don't think that has a whole lot to do with it. This is a body. Some of us are hands. Some are feet. Some are lips. Some are kneecaps. Some are elbows. Some are pinky toes. But we're all part of the same body. We're one. Okay? So we see this in the life of the early church, and it's kind of refreshing. Um, the other thing that I won't necessarily go into right now, just because we're running out of time, I, I would encourage you to do this, though. Write down these two references. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And then write this down. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. 
Check those out sometime. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17, and Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. Because here's what I love. The Bible has given us pretty much all the counsel we need on how to navigate interpersonal conflict. And where I think we so often stumble is when we don't manage our interpersonal conflict appropriately. You know, Jesus says, somebody sins against you, what do you do? Go to that person and tell them between you and him alone. Not go home from church and get on Facebook and say, when I was at church this morning, and many of you know the church that I go to, I saw a certain person who I hadn't seen for three months. In fact, the last time I saw them was on February 17th of last year. They were wearing this, and they sat in this row. But I won't tell you who it was. And we start trying to highlight their sin instead of doing the courageous thing because it takes courage and it takes the Holy Spirit and it takes humility to go to someone and say, I was offended. And by the way, if you've offended someone, guess who's supposed to go and say that you offended? You are, right? It's always on you. If someone offends me, I'm supposed to go to them. If I offend someone, I'm supposed to go to them. And if we all would go to people when we've offended them, or we would all go to people when they've offended us, do you realize how many interpersonal conflicts would not exist? But when we start going to other people and building our little camp, meanwhile, they're over here building their little camp. Careful. That's dissension. That's division. Okay? Here's the last thing I want to talk about, okay? We've talked about opposition from the government, opposition from religious groups. We've talked about financial problems very briefly. Then there's people problems. There's disagreements. But here's the last thing I want to talk about. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> this, again, this is one of those things. It could become an entire study. Acts chapter 20, look towards the halfway through the, the chapter. Verse 27, Paul says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Verse 29 of Acts chapter 20. Because I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So here's the counsel, verse 31. Therefore, watch. Watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Here is a problem that the, early, that the church has encountered from the very beginning. False teaching. False teaching's always been there. I mean, when you look through the New Testament letters, it's, it's mentioned in almost every single one of them. I mean, when Jesus writes to the churches in the book of Revelation, he says that one of the things he has against one of the churches is that they're allowing false teaching to go on. False teaching's a big deal. It's a big deal because right doctrine results in right living. What we believe determines how we live. And so what we have to be careful of, okay, to kind of balance what I was saying a moment ago, these interpersonal relationships, and, you know, I don't want to give you the impression that it's like, hey, just everybody kind of figure out this thing on their own. No, the Bible's pretty clear on stuff. There's just some areas where it's, it's been silent, and we have the Holy Spirit who will guide us into all truth, and we have convictions. Okay, but what I'm saying is that when there's false teaching, that's a big deal. And we have to be careful that we don't buy into this school of thought that's like, oh, you know what? Who am I to say? Who am I to say? And by the way, false teaching never advertises itself as false teaching. 
You know, you're not going to see rolling into Sacramento the latest false teaching conference expose 2017, right? Buy my latest book. It's called False Doctrine. No one, no, it's not advertised that way. False teaching a lot of times sounds really good. That's what makes it, that's what makes it so dangerous. You know, I mean, it's not like Satan slithered up to Eve and was like, hey, I'm going to tell you a lie. He came up and he said, did God really say that? Well, did God really mean that? Which is really kind of enlightening because that means it all happened in the context of a conversation. I remember years ago watching a particular false teacher who I won't necessarily name right now, but I remember that their whole approach to teaching was, let me ask you a question. And they weren't called teachings. They were called dialogues. Let's have a dialogue. Let me ask you a, qu a question. If, Je if we found out that Jesus had an earthly father named Larry, would it really matter? That was the context of the dialogue. Well, here's the problem. If we found out that Jesus had an earthly father named Larry, that means Mary is a lying whore. And Jesus was born out of the context of what this says, so how can I believe this to be true? So it does make a difference. So be careful when somebody comes to you, and I'm not saying that as Christians we switch off our brain and we're just like, eh, no. But be careful when somebody comes to you and says, hey, let me ask you a question. Does it really matter about that? Well, God said it. He took the time to, I mean, I try not to get up here in front of you and say stuff that I think doesn't matter. You know, I mean, if you're in the middle of talking to me and you're, you're thinking it's important enough for you to take the time to talk to me and I just kind of, you know, put on my earphones and I'm just like, I'm listening. You'd be like, no, you're not. I don't think God took the time to preserve this down through the ages because it doesn't matter. I think he took the time to preserve this down through the ages because it's the truth. And we need the truth. And so when somebody comes up to you and says, but is that what that really means? Yes, it is. That is what that means. And you'll be really unpopular when you start to live your life that way. I mean, the great thing is, so was Jesus. You know, I mean, in, in, in one teaching, Jesus diminished his congregation by thousands of people. And when they all left, he turned to his faithful 12 and said, are you leaving too? And it's like we've gotten so into a mode where we're more sort of enamored with numbers. And, and I don't trust God enough with this thing to say the hard stuff that needs to be said because it's true. And without it, we're going to go awry in our lives. No, this, this is true. And Jesus said, don't marvel when the world hates you, because it hated me first. But one of the things that's so fantastic about the book of Acts, and like I said, we've not done a verse-by-verse -verse study. What, what I hope is happening, though, is as we go through these little snapshots, is you're developing more of a, of a hunger to want to go back and just digest the whole thing. Because it's amazing. And there's so much that we glean as the church in 2017 from this church that we read about, the church that we read about in the book of Acts. So, lots there. And these are five. There were other things that we could have talked about today, but we'll leave that for another time. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that you've never called any of us to figure this thing out, you've told us straight up that you'll, you'll tell us, you'll guide us.
And I pray, Lord, that we would become people more committed to prayer, more committed to your word, more committed to waiting upon the prompting of your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would continue to build your church in the world today, that we would know and be convinced that none of the challenges that we encounter are unknown to you or foreign to you or beyond your capability. Lord, I pray that you continue to establish your church in the world right here on Bogue Road in 2017 that you want it to be. It's yours. And we acknowledge that before you today, Lord. We're blessed. We're humbled by your word. Again, pray that you write it on our hearts, Lord, that this becomes who we are. Thank you that it's true and reliable. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless, guys. We're going to close with a song.